Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you again. So how's it going with the Gandell situation? Can, can you give us an idea uh, to educate me on uh, the focuses and disciplines you put on how you guys invest? for? Uh, in terms of the community uh, in terms of investment your community that we do, yes. So Jeff uh, um, Gandalf Philanthropy is a private family foundation. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's the Gandalf family that started this some 40 years ago now, mm -hmm. and over time it grew to be one of the largest private uh, family foundations in Australia. The uh, uh, remit of the foundation is quite broad, one could think, because we have sort of six key areas of interest, but we try to uh, focus within each one of those. So the family, Gandalf family, I guess is probably best known for supporting arts and cultural programs and health and medical research. Mm -hmm. But we also support uh, various programs and activities in the area of education, particularly early childhood development and early child childhood education, Jewish identity and leadership, Youth at Risk, which we talked about a little previously, and Indigenous programs. So uh, I would mention Indigenous programs in particular because it's such a broad area. But uh, as an example for us, again, within that space, we try and focus and narrow down uh, the, the, the work that we do there and fund. So we try and focus on early childhood development, mm -hmm. education and employment, incarceration, trying to support indigenous communities to reduce the number of people in prison, and particularly young indigenous women at risk, because mm. we know that there are certain challenges there. So primarily Australia, but then Israel as well? We support, obviously, uh, um, a lot of organizations in Australia. So our remit in Australia is to support for Australian and Jewish community. But also overseas, we support uh, programs and activities in Israel, yep. particularly the ones that benefit refugee and migrant populations in that country. Yes. Tell me, Jeff, a little bit about the work you do, because you are, uh, for all intents and purposes, seen as one of the sort of entrepreneurs within the philanthropic space. So I'll be keen to hear what are your sort of uh, highlights in terms of what you do. Yeah, I guess, well, we really just, uh, up to now, we haven't had a, our own um, philanthropic fund legally set up, although we're in the process of doing that. Mm -hmm. Up to now, it's been uh, our own family's donations on an annual basis. And I, I set a template, Victoria only, mm -hmm. um, and primarily youth at risk, although we've got some homeless housing initiatives now, but primarily youth at risk. And, I, and the template is 10% of after-tax income I donate each year, roughly. And, ten, and around about 10% of my time, roughly as well. So that's the sort of template, but only Australia and only in Victoria. But I'm, I'm rather focused on youth at risk because, um, <clears throat> and, and behavioural change in that youth at risk, not just giving them a bed or, a, or a f f food, but um, trying to change, change behaviours to get them out of that space and into a, a full award-based job, because once you've got a job, that can be life-changing. <coughs> and... Um, the primary space in that area that we're focusing on at the moment is social enterprise, to grow the social enterprise space, because in Australia there's 60,000 charities, many who are small to medium and many who are struggling to survive every year. Uh, most of those charities would have to raise up to 90% of their funds every year from donations, philanthropic, government, etc. Whereas 30,000 social enterprises, most embryonic, uh, raise their funds from their own business activities some 100% they're fully funded from their own business activities. So essentially a social enterprise is a, is a, a business providing, using their own funds for community purposes. Mm. Um, one of the biggest ones in Melbourne Street, which is the one we are substantial financial backers of on an annual basis. Uh, we also bought their building in Collingwood in Melbourne uh, for two and a half million dollars. And an interesting model there was, as we discussed previously, veteran, was that the, we, we purchased the building We've given them a lease for 50 years for $5 a year. Um, we've done a deal with the state government to forgive land tax, which was roughly nearly $100,000. Uh, so we've forgiven $200,000. We get $100,000 relief off land tax. They get basically free rent, and this building can do good for 50 years. It provides a community outcomes, but the family still gets capital gain because we own the building. Uh, and in the street case now, they're getting about... 400 kids a year through their programs, intensive nine-month workshops, both in this building 
uh, some training at RMIT and youth counselling. These kids are from the worst of the worst situations who are either in, in jail system or in the court system or on the streets. Um, they go through this intensive youth counselling and training, working in the four businesses that are in this street building in Collingwood and a couple of other ancillary businesses so they get a sense of belonging working in the businesses whilst they're training. And after the nine month course, we've had over a 90% effective rate getting these kids into full award-based jobs. And one of the companies we're involved with is Fonda, which is a fresh casual dining company uh, with eight restaurants in Melbourne. We've, we give them full award-based scholarships in there. The kids are interested in getting involved in the mm. kitchens and, and, and food and bev um, serving at the front end. Mm. Uh, and, and we're doing a deal with some other companies as well. So, so non-employable through the training system and then into jobs. And the social enterprise street now is at 80% of fully self-funding all these activities from the business activities. So, and hoping to get to 100% within three years. So I think that the social enterprise model is quite powerful. If we can have a bunch of these around Australia, and I'm talking about in the thousands, the sort of a, the private enterprise fulfilling community needs but totally sustainable from their own income. And those mm. needs, a lot of those people are working in or part of those businesses, that's a wonderful outcome. Mm. So I'm really, we're really passionate about that. And the other space we're involved with is, is to, um, we've just purchased uh, $4 million worth of kit houses and donated them to Launch, which is a government um, long-term housing, manages the long-term housing waiting list for the mm. state government. And we're putting those on government land. So uh, the huge part of the house and land package is the land. So we get free land from Vic Roads. We've got 22,000 titles of land in Victoria for future off ramps mm. and freeways. And we've already had the first uh, eight, so seven blocks totally populated with our kid houses now for these long-term homeless people. Mm. Uh, and many of them are single women. There's no space in the government homeless housing mix for single dwellings. Mm. So these we can, ha we can build landscape plum sewer, put them on a block of land for $100,000. The minimum the state government's spending at the moment is $250,000 yeah. on, yeah. on the homeless waiting list. So it's an interesting model. Yeah. That's good to hear, Jeff. Um, I'm particularly interested in what you talked about with street, uh, launch housing as well, and, and they're both organizations that we supported as well. So there is a touch point for us oh, as well. Okay. But uh, with social enterprise, one of the uh, uh, things that we are looking at very carefully is how do we help grow that particular sector? Yep. Because we are very much of the view, just like you, that they are an excellent model of not just providing support, not just training people and getting them out of uh, difficulty and then hopefully into jobs, yep. but also actually uh, um, earning their own income so that they can use for working in whatever space they work and, and have more funding for that. Yep. Uh, just recently, we've been talking a lot about the whole issue of social procurement yes. and the things that are happening, <coughs> particularly with large scale projects in Victoria and how can we help these social enterprises actually uh, equip themselves better to be successful tenderers for large uh, uh, contracts yep. with the likes of you know uh, Westgate Tunnel or Melbourne City Link and so on and so yep. forth. Uh, it's, it's actually a challenging space because a lot of not-for-profits and a lot of uh, organizations that work and have a social enterprise are very good at a smaller scale work but then, you know, if you are delivering 500 sandwiches a day, they might be able to do it. But if you need 50,000 sandwiches a day, how do we help them scale up? Yes. And it could be a win-win uh, for all sides because certainly the Victorian government particularly is keen to entrench that a little bit more yeah. with uh, large corporates. Uh, yeah. And large corporates want to do it as well because they have that social sort of license that they want to uh, implement. Yep. But then how do we help the likes of street to meet that demand? So we are trying to work with some organizations, not, uh, uh, namely Social Traders and Social Ventures Australia, to yep. help them help upscale those uh, 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 social enterprises to be able to be a meaningful partner or a meaningful tenderer in that sort of whole process. Um, well, that's fantastic. And with the, you know, an organisation with a scale of yours that's doing that. I've actually just had a book published called Dollars and Cents, which is a, a book on a case studies of 40 social enterprises and their mm. entrepreneurs that have set them up and the challenges they've had. So if anyone's out there is interested in, in buying this book, it's called Dollars and Cents, you can get it online. I um, should get one as well. <laughs> well I, I'll send one to you. Actually. Okay. Um, but that talks Thanks. a fair bit about the 
the procurement governments, uh, companies buying from social enterprise to give mm. them, uh, help help them in their business journey. Um, and I think, I mean, also the other thing we've discussed in the book is the lack of sort of governance or structure around a social enterprise structure mm. and how they taxed mm. and whatever the governments don't know quite how to treat mm. them. So in the UK, for instance, it's under the, there's a federal federal minister, it's under their wing, and then there's, mm. a, there's a national sort of corporate governance system for mm. social enterprise. We don't have that in Australia. So mm. I think there needs to be more work on, say, the minister of small business, say, in our mm. federal cabinet, maybe needs to have social enterprise under his or her wing mm. to help grow that space, which mm. will help us people yeah. in our areas mm. um, um, work with the social mm. enterprise sector. And I think the other area that we can also add value in is, a, is well, that I've tried to do is, with the 10% of my time, is mentoring and coaching some of the CEOs in this space so that they've Primarily, these, usually these people are very passionate about their social cause, but aren't necessarily all that good about running a business. Mm -hmm. So coaching them on, a, on just basically how to set a proper budget and cash flow and what have you. So just basic coaching them on, the, on their business side of things. And the other thing we've done in our family offices, partnership with a little organisation called Tonic, which has got now four people and they provide back advice on the back end services for not mm. for profit, so charities or social enterprises mm. and how to set up their accounting or marketing or mm. uh, back end infrastructure mm. and give them professional advice on a fee for service, dollar per mm. hour type charge to get that properly done. And there's a lot of work to be done there. And indeed, I think a lot of charities really may be setting up a shared services model mm. for the back end mm. in a charity sector is something we'd like to see as well to save costs rather than everyone having their, this immediate mm. back mm. end and all the costs yeah. that that entails. So that's another discussion as yeah. well. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good one because that's one of the things that uh, you hear often uh, uh, within the not-for-profit sector about how do they operate, are they getting the benefit of doing things uh, well and, and productively and so on. Yep. And that's something that we try to sort of uh, um, improve in the sector as well. Yep. But you mentioned one other thing, which was about that sort of uh, policy space. And I think that's one of the things that uh, philanthropy should be doing as well. Mm. Uh, because very often whatever not-for-profits do, it's based around whatever the policies of governments are, and yep. particularly in social enterprise space, yep. which we were which I know uh, about the whole issue of lack of understanding and legislation around it and how they are treated. Yes. These are the sorts of things I believe philanthropy and individuals like you can actually uh, do more of to influence government to uh, set the scene, if you will, set mm. the parameters that are beneficial mm. to the likes of social enterprises and then they can go on from there. Yep. Uh, in fact, I would mention something completely different to social enterprise, but very much in that policy space which is the uh, home stretch campaign. I'm not sure if you heard of that. I'm not aware of that no. But that is basically a campaign that uh, has been uh, driven by Anglicare, uh, Victoria, but nationally as well, uh, as a lead organization for some 300 not-for-profits that work in out-of-home care. And research from overseas, again, namely UK, but other countries as well, shows that if you increase uh, um, the time that um, young people are supported from 18 until 21 in out-of-home care, the, the results uh, for those young people are much better if they are supported for those additional three years. Yeah. Uh, they reduce um, their sort of, uh, um, <coughs> sort of um, uh, entry into um, uh, prison system or others by about 30%. Oh, entry into employment in, gets uh, increased by about 40% just because they're um, assisted and supported for another three years. Wow. So we have funded Anglicare Victoria uh, to uh, do the home stretch campaign, which is a pure advocacy campaign to influence state governments in Australia yep. to uh, uh, increase the support to those young people from 18 to 21. Yep. And in Victoria, the state government actually did that, and they are now trialing that particular process. So that's the policy setting that we as philanthropists can help not-for-profits set up in a way that will have better results for the young people at risk. Yeah, great. I think just going back to the, the, the homeless housing thing that we're partnering with Launch, one of the, I'll tell you a lovely story. We, I, I think the basics in Australian society, there's three basics that are non-negotiable if I was the Prime Minister. One is basic education for all. Mm. Um, one is basic health cover for all in a civilised society with mm. good values that we're passionate about. So housing, or healthcare, 
education and housing is the third. So mm. everyone should have a right to those three basics in a civilised mm. uh, modern democracy. Mm. Unfortunately in Australia, I think we have a great health system, a good education system, but our social housing thing really does need to be grown and developed so mm. much more. Um, and I'll tell you a wonderful story of this. The first block of uh, six houses, these are kit houses that we can fit on the back of a truck that we put on this Vic Roads landing. We donated these houses to launch a case manager. Mm. The, I took the first six people out for dinner about a month ago. And one of the ladies, a woman about 52, um, looked to me and she took me in a little little house. She's only been in her two weeks and she'd set up a little herb garden mm. and she was growing some flowers. And she started to tear up and say, this is the first place I've had of my own in my whole life. Mm. And I said, what's your, what's your story? And at, at, at um, 14 years old, she'd witnessed her, her um, mother, uh, who was shot in front of her by a, a stepfather, um, and she had a really violent uh, upbringing with a stepfather up to then as well. So it was a terrible upbringing. So this mm. poor woman had had a dysfunctional teenage years and had been in and out of all sorts of problem areas with... Um, you know, justice areas and in mm. trouble with the courts and what have you. But it was the first time in her whole life, now in her 50s, she's had her own accommodation mm. and, she, and she was so mm. proud. So uh, we have got hundreds of thousands of people like that. Every one of those homeless people has got a story to tell. Mm. They're normal people, mm. they're Australians, they're fellow Australians. And we need to do more as a government, as a society on how we mm. can handle that. Now maybe it's a, a bigger percentage of our superannuation funds mm. that we all contribute to. Maybe 5% of the national super fund uh, um, there's a caveat there that they have to invest in social, social housing. housing yeah. They get a return. Uh, those people that move into social housing they have to pay part of their welfare mm. or, or a part, some money for those social, that social housing. Uh, but we need to think entrepreneurially on how mm. we can solve this issue. Yeah. Um, I've just come back from Morocco and I noted there that the king of Morocco was bulldozing a lot of slums in all the major cities. And the government was then going to the banks and being a guarantor to, uh, so they're borrowing millions of dollars to build mm. uh, three-storey blocks of apartments and telling those previous slum dwellers, okay, you can now have an apartment if it was 30,000 US. They, could, they had to pay a deposit of 3,000. They had to pay uh, a rent on that. Mm. That rent would go back to the government. So now we're building hundreds of thousands of these units uh, for these people. So the government have a liability here on, as, as the guarantor on the loan for the bank to finance it, but they'd have an asset here for mm. these people who own the houses. Mm. So, and that asset would increase mm. in value. Then they went to developers to come up with the cheapest way of building these houses. Um, and then the, and they'd get the national competition for the cheapest uh, quote. Mm. And those builders, they'd, they'd then have tax offsets on the development mm. of the building sites. And they'd also allow the developers to have mm. the bottom floor for retail so they can get rent a higher rent in. So they had a really interesting model and they mm. were building hundreds of thousands mm. and selling these inner city slums, the, the land that they were pulling down the slums, selling that that land to help offset the cost of the new developers mm. near public transport and the outer areas of mm. the cities. Exactly like we could do here. Yeah. So there's some interesting stuff going on, but I think we need to do a lot more as a country in that space. Yes. I completely agree. Uh, the thing that strikes me often is that there are many models around the world that you see where they actually managed to tackle the problem quite successfully. One of the things that uh, is often said within the sector is that housing is really the key. Yep. It's the, uh, the first step and then you can provide all those other wraparound services. And in fact, particularly in New, in New York, there is the well-known housing first model that actually worked quite well, rather than going step by step with a homeless person through various stages until they get a proper housing. They basically literally took people from the bench into the apartment, but then provide very strong wraparound service. Mm. One of the challenges with that sort of stuff is that um, I hear often governments or you know public uh, 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 sort of uh, bureaucrats would say it's very expensive. And uh, it, just recently I was actually at the Melbourne City Mission. Uh, they redeveloped their uh, King Street property, which they do as a front yard service, which does provide wraparound uh, uh, so, um, sort of support for young people at risk. And we funded that um, along with many others. Mm, and wonderful. it was interesting at the launch, there was a talk about the fact that it is uh, very expensive. It's a costly program and it's twice uh, the uh, cost of the other programs. And I had a chance to speak and actually talk about that. And what I said is uh, maybe you can look at it uh, a, a different way. You said it's twi the, twice the cost of a normal program. 
I look at it as four times the benefit for the community and for the society because if you divert just one person from being a burden on the society for the rest of the, their lives to actually become a net contributor to the yes. society, you get a much better return. So I think often Indeed. the problem is that we look at everything as a cost yes. as opposed to investment that will return for the society. So yep. there is a lot to be done, I think, in that space by us to yep. convince governments yep. to look at these other opportunities, whether it's Morocco or New York or some other places where they actually successfully manage to address an issue, particularly of housing supply, but then also those wraparound services, which to my view for those complex cases are actually vital Absolutely and critically vital. important. Yep. If you just give them a home, that's not going to work, yep. but if you provide proper services, it will. Yep, and that's what in our situation, we're doing a, a partnership with Launch who manage the long-term waiting, who then provide uh, weekly and fortnightly mm. wraparound services exactly. for our, our, our yeah. folks. So you're absolutely mm. spot on. Mm. The dividends to society for every one person that can be taken out of the mm. loop, as it were, mm. uh, are substantial. So. Yeah. It's very interesting to, to talk about these things because, <coughs> you know, there are one of the other challenges that I see is there are a lot of ideas and initiatives that are happening. My question is how do we, as uh, uh, philanthropists or as people that are trying to help connect the dots, mm and uh, how do we really sort of get to scale with these sorts of things. I think that's one of the problems. Uh, in fact, uh, as we talked about social enterprises, as I mentioned, we are doing a few things. I would like to see more of social enterprises out there, but also the ones that are stronger, that are at scale, that can do things, especially when they are employing people or training people, such as what Street does but also a few other organizations that I know that work with people mm. that have been in the justice system or indeed people with disability and how you can actually provide them with an opportunity to live meaningful lives. Mm. Mm. I was at, a, tra I was at a, a function, a, a charity function the other night and it was for a youth-based charity. They were a, a traditional charity, a long-standing youth-based charity and they're, they're have been underwater the last five years in terms of losing money and they might just break even this year. But they have their model is they have to raise 90 to 92, 93 percent on average the last five years of funds, new funds mm. every year just to survive. Mm. So you really wonder whether a lot of small traditional charities are going to survive. The big mm. ones will, but the smaller ones with and they've all got their back end support structure mm. as well. Is that model going to survive, or will it be disrupted, or is? Mm. It, and I, I think that's where the social enterprise model has mm. incredible benefits. Mm. That uh, when it's properly scaled and the procurement side of it is worked through, like mm. the good work uh, you're doing, um, that once once that gets scale, mm. then I think we'll have we've got to grow a new sector that that will be much more sustainable. Mm. I think that's really important. You mentioned one thing there, which I think is uh, for us really very important, which is you know talking about then them having to raise that money every year. And uh, I'm a strong believer and the family is strong backer of multi-year funding. We see that as one of the sort of key planks of what we're trying to do. Mm. There is plenty of research that shows that uh, multi-year funding benefits not only the funder because we can actually go deeper into the issue and understand it better and measure it better, but also the recipient organization because they have some certainty going forward yep. so they can plan around it. How long would you typically, would you have a timeline that you'd give uh, to organizations? We don't necessarily uh, are limited, but it can be anywhere between two and five years. Two and five years. But in fact, in recent times, we've been talking to the board and uh, developing model modules and models in terms of going even further. So when you first commit to that funding, you'll mm. say this is for a two to five year tranche Correct. to give them that cash yes, flow yeah. and that, that certainty. So we provide that grant. It's That's a multi-year grant. Like it's two or three or four or five years. Yep. We do say, and they need to understand that very well, that uh, future uh, installments are subject to satisfactory prog progress. Yep. So you yep. can't just take it for granted, obviously, both sides, uh, both us and them. But if they are tracking well, we will continue with them. But uh, what I was just about to say is that we are looking now at p potentially even longer time frames mm. because there are more and more uh, uh, examples coming, particularly from the US, of support going beyond five years, up to seven and ten years, oh, in actually really strengthening the organization. Mm. And part of that, you talked about mentoring. I'm a big believer in mentoring. 
part of that long-term support is actually strengthening the management of the organization, yes. helping them retain the really good people because very often they would be great people but they really decide after a few years to leave and go to you know other bigger and better things. But if they feel that there is certainty, that there is prospect in that organization, they will stick around mm. and you can then really plan much better. And I believe that if you have strong management, then the organization itself can do more of what they're doing, yep. whether it's you know helping homeless people or indeed doing arts programs and so on. How do you put the rigor around? Because sometimes governments will want to <coughs> say, well, okay, what's the effectiveness of our helping out this particular charity or community endeavor? They want to see some sort of data. How, how do you... What, what rigors do you put around mm. that? How, how if you... I can say, Jeff, that's the $50 million question. I think the whole philanthropic sector, but also the not-for-profit sector, are grappling with that. Yes, indeed. Uh, particularly not-for-profit sector is very good at measuring outputs. But it's not about outputs. It's really about the outcomes yes. and what I call the impact. So the output, if your output is around homelessness, it would be about you know, how many people you supported, what you gave them. But uh, the, the outcome is whether there has been any change in their condition and the impact is whether there has been any impact on them personally and the broader society. Yeah. I think that for us at least, it's still work in progress. Certain things you can measure very easily, other things it's very difficult to measure and we are trying to develop that you know, monitoring and evaluation framework for each one of our areas. Yes. Some are very simple. You know, if you want to look at medical research and if you're funding a particular piece of research, I think it's fairly straightforward to measure whether that, that has been successful or not. Yep. In particular for us, it's about translational research and whether that research will change to, uh, change, uh, lead to change in practice and better patient outcomes. But there are many other things that are far more difficult to measure. And all I can say is still work in progress. Yeah. One of the interesting things we're going through also at the moment is the intergenerational, in our family, intergenerational handover of community activities. I'm interested, interested from your perspective from the Gandell family, but I've got uh, three children. Uh, so uh, trying to get them involved in what, what uh, we have been doing as a family, but what they want to get involved mm. in as well going forward mm. for their next generation, mm. as it were, and having them have the ownership of those causes so they will want to spend time and, and efforts in those various areas as well. What Can you give some of advice course, there? Of course, Jeff. Because uh, we're in you, our infancy in terms of what... Yeah, to, but I think you nailed it there. It is about doing philanthropy on their terms rather than telling them this is how we do it, this is how you should do it. Mm. Uh, we are fortunate in Gandal Philanthropy that we have, obviously, <coughs> John and Pauline, who yep. are the founders of Gandal Philanthropy, still involved yep. and very active, which I'm really pleased about. Yep. There is one of the children involved on the board as well, and she is quite active. Yep. And then we have a couple of grandchildren as well that are very interested in these sorts of things. Wonderful. But as you mentioned, uh, for them, it's very much about what they really want to do. So one of yep. the granddaughters uh, is currently in New York. She worked for Rockefeller philanthropy advisors for a few years, mm. just trying to sort of get her stripes. And now she's involved with one impact investment company. Mm. And that's that sort of new territory uh, for uh, philanthropy, both in the US in particular, but also in Australia. Yeah. How maybe can you actually deploy your corpus for social benefit and so on? Yes. Uh, they, uh, younger generations are very interested in very tangible hands-on direct engagement, which we can do as well. Mm. Uh, but uh, w again, what I would say is that what we are trying to do as, if you will, uh, bureaucrats of, of philanthropy is to offer all the generations uh, opportunities, ideas and different models of getting involved. Yes. So we have a couple of other uh, grandchildren that are involved in very simple, direct decision making around where they would like an allocation of funding to go yes. uh, to causes dear to their heart. Yes. But we also then talk to the, these other ones and looking at how can we incorporate impact investment into our own decision making. The investment committee that makes decisions around how funds are invested is now looking at a couple of opportunities with organizations that we have supported. Yep. We believe it should be mission aligned. So we're trying to do that. So I think that answer to your question is about talk to them 
talk to your younger generations and ask them, ask them what they would like to be involved. Yes. If they're not sure, sometimes they are young, they're not still sure about what they could do or what they would like to do, give them options. Yes. That's another way of That's doing it. Advice. Tell them these are different options. You can look at this, you can look at that. Yep. And I believe most importantly, I think some of your kids are already involved in that, okay. but most importantly, expose them to these things. Yes. Take them to see for themselves. Nothing beats like the story you talked about, that uh, old lady which has that apartment for the first time. If one of your kids or grandkids sees that, that might trigger something in them that they say, I want to get involved in this. Yes, indeed. Mm. Jeff, it's been great. It's been fantastic. Very good to talk it's to always you. always a pleasure. And we need to do more in collaborating. We do. Okay. Okay. That's our next step. Thank you, mate.